Well, good morning. I am Pastor Brian Sewell, and I'm glad you're joining us once again. We are right in the middle of this study on Easter and looking at some of the people who were there in the final hours of Christ and his death and burial and resurrection. And uh, today we're actually going to be studying about one of the Roman soldiers that was there in those final hours. And and he was actually a centurion. And um, and so we'll just uh, jump right into the study here this morning. And I want to talk a little bit about the centurions, uh, give you a little bit of an idea of what they were like. And I'm going to use some of these uh, word pictures, if you will. One of the things you'll notice right off the bat about a centurion, they were very uh, responsible and they were loyal people. Um, they were in charge of actually a hundred soldiers, as many as a hundred soldiers, um, and the centurions had that charge over them. They were ones that had a, that critical role in, in taking the um, actually the, the battle plan of the commanders over them and putting it right on the field and, and ensuring the success of that battle plan. And so these soldiers, they were like the top sergeant, if you will. The generals um, may have, uh, they made the plan for the strategies and decided upon the tactics. But again, it was the top centurion that actually carried out that plan on the ground. So responsible and loyal was uh, one of those word pictures you could um, consider about the centurions. Another one was honorable and respected. You know, the centurion earned his position the hard way. Uh, he uh, earned the respect of others. The centurion uh, was one of the highest ranks that an ordinary soldier could achieve. And most centurions were appointed because uh, they were favored by their ranking officials and also Roman officials. Um, these promotions were almost always based upon the soldier's merit and also uh, good conduct was a key factor as well. So the centurions, they would have been very well known in their communities and their, their towns where they lived. Um, another couple words to uh, give you an idea of an um, inside uh, picture, what's going on there with the centurions. They were also brave and courageous. The centurions' uh, duty boiled down to one thing. It was this brutality of uh, this hand-to-hand -hand combat on the field. And it was bloody and gory so many times. and. And the battle went to the strongest and, and the most determined. And it was in these harsh conditions that the centurion uh, learned to be a survivor. And so the Roman centurion would have led the charge in the battle, implementing the ground strategy of the generals over them. So centurions, they were responsible and loyal. They were uh, honorable and respected. They were brave and courageous. And there is one more thing I want to uh, share with you. They were also hard and calloused, if you will. Centurion would have seen it all. They, they uh, would have been that there um, in combat. The brutality of the war was a way of life for them. But out of combat, the centurion would provide security and protection uh, when called upon. The centurions would have also, they would have supervised police action in occupied areas. And most notably for, for our study today, anyway, is this, that um, the centurions would have uh, overseen the brutal Roman executions. They uh, carried out the horrific scourgings of, of the convicted criminals and the excruciating crucifixions. Now, before we go on, I just want to sh uh, share just a little bit about the Roman scourging. It was a, a brutal thing that happened back there in the time of Christ. And you'll notice uh, this is a common instrument for the scourgings. Um, there was a, a whip made of you know two or three or even more strands. Um, on those strands were tied lead pieces, um, lead balls, also uh, sheep bone shard and and these uh, whips were, uh, of course, meant to inflict uh, severe pain. So let me talk to you about the scourging. The scourging, uh, the victim was stripped of his clothing and his hands were tied to an upright post. And, and of course, then they were not able to get away during these scourgings, could not run away, uh, tied to these posts. Something else we, we know in the scourgings, the back and the buttocks and the legs were flogged by two soldiers or by one soldier who alternated positions um, from the right to the left of the, the victim in the back. Um, the Roman scourging also the iron balls, we talked about the whip, 
It would cause deep contusions and the leather uh, thongs and the sheep bones would have cut into the skin and the underlying tissue. And it would have literally ripped the flesh and the muscle off of the person that was experiencing these scourgings. So again, um, the, the centurion, the soldiers underneath him, they would have been very hard and calloused. And, and so that's um, important to know as we come into this study here this, this morning. Um, the goal of the scourging was bottom line to uh, bring excruciating pain, to bring that person to, to bodily collapse and near death. They didn't want to bring them all the way to death, but near death uh, just before the crucifixion. Um, and also before we go on, I just want to mention a couple of prominent centurions in scripture because it's, it's helpful in understanding the centurion of the cross. Uh, a couple of uh, prominent centurions. There was a centurion at Capernaum, and that's found in Luke in chapter 7. That uh, centurion, we read the story here, when he, Jesus, was not far from the house, a centurion sent friends saying to him, Lord, do not trouble or yourself, for I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore, I did not presume to come to you, but say the word and let my servant be healed. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him and turning to the crowd that followed him, he said, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. And when those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the servant well. So here's a centurion there in the book of Luke, or the gospel of Luke, who knew that Jesus was one that healed people and he uh, submitted himself and, and sought to find Jesus and found him, sent his um, servants to him to try to get Jesus to, to actually help in this situation. And Jesus, in fact, did. He healed the servant. And just an incredible story of a servant that displayed great faith. There's a, another servant, uh, the centurion of, or I should say centurion, another centurion of the shipwreck in Acts in chapter 7, or chapter 27, 28. And we read that story, and when it was decided that we should sail for Italy, they delivered Paul and some other prisoners to the centurion of, of Augustan cohort named Julius. But the weather ch uh, changed abruptly, a wind of typhoon strength called a northeaster, burst across the island, blew us out to sea. The sailors couldn't turn the ship into the wind, so they gave up and let it run before the gale. The terrible storm raged for many days, blotting out the sun and the stars until at last all hope was gone. And when daylight came, um, they did not recognize the land, but they saw a bay with a sandy beach and the soldiers planned to kill the prisoners, Paul being one of them plan to uh, kill the prisoners to prevent any of them from swimming away and escaping. But the centurion wanted to save Paul's life and kept them from carrying out their plan. So another um, a story of a centurion, there were actually six centurions mentioned in the New Testament. And this is this, uh, the second one of the two that we're looking at this morning. But anyway, here's a centurion that, that ended up seeing Paul's faith there on the ship during this uh, horrible storm and came to have um, compassion upon the Apostle Paul, even in the midst of his callousness and his hardness. So examples of two centurions were the, where the gospel reached into their lives and softened their hearts, and they came to um, experience something of the, the love of Christ and incredible um, love of God. So we've come now to this great confession of the centurion at the cross and an incredible confession. And here it is. When the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, truly this was the Son of God. Now there in the uh, New Living Translation, it says it's like this, the Roman officer and the other soldiers at the crucifixion were terrified by the earthquake and all that had happened. And they said, this man truly was the son of God. So there was this awe and there was this fear and, and, and actually being terrified of all that was going on. And then again, that statement, that confession, this man truly was the son of God. Now the question then is, was this a true confession? Was this a genuine confession of, of faith in Christ? Was it a genuine confession of faith? Or was it just a Roman uh, officer, a, a centurion and his men, trying to define something that was outside their scope of experience? Now, I think the evidence is compelling, actually, 
that's in favor of the centurion displaying a genuine confession of faith. Now, certainly the centurion would have given uh, weight and would not have ignored the displaying of, of uh, or the, the condemnation, I should say, of the Jewish religious leaders, and nor could he um, just ignore his commander-in-chief, Pontius Pilate, who upheld the conviction of the Jewish leaders. But the evidence that this was a true confession of faith is, is very compelling, and I want you to see why. The first reason why I believe this was a, a true confession of faith and so many other um, um, Christian uh, scholars, conservative scholars believe as well, that it was uh, just an extraordinary, amazing response that Jesus had to the injustice that was dealt out to him. And I want you to see this, and, and this is the injustice, uh, some of the account there. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking false testimony against Jesus that they might put him to death, but they found none, though many false witnesses came forward. At last, two came forward and said, this man said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to rebuild it in three days. And the high priest stood up and said, have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But then Jesus remained silent. And then the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the son of God. Jesus said to him, you have said so. But I tell you from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his robes and said, He has uttered blasphemy. What further witnesses do we need? You have now heard his blasphemy. What is your judgment? They answered, He deserves death. Then they spit in his face and struck him, and some slapped him, saying, Prophesy to us, you Christ. Who is it that struck you? In the midst of all that, it's just simply amazing that there, even in the light of no real witnesses, that through it all, Jesus may uh, remain calm and collected and not lashing out at all at the injustice. Just incredible. Well, there's also the extraordinary, amazing response of Jesus to the torture that took place that day. We see these words and Mark in chapter 15, wishing to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas for them, and after having Jesus scourged, he handed him over to be crucified. The soldiers took him away into the palace, that is the praetorium, and they called together the whole Roman cohort. By the way, that's 600 soldiers. They dressed him up in purple, and after twisting a crown of thorns, they put it on him and they began to, pro uh, began to acclaim him, Hail, King of the Jews! They kept beating his head with a reed and spitting on him and kneeling and bowing before him. In the midst of all this, in the midst of the, the, the torture, Jesus continued to hold it together. He didn't lash out. He didn't, he didn't uh, lash out at them. He didn't curse at them. He didn't begin fighting back. He kept remaining uh, calm, uh, calmed and silent in, in the midst of all this. There's also this extraordinary and amazing mercy of Jesus shown um, very clearly in this account. When they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right and the other on the left. But Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots, dividing up his garments among themselves. Incredibly moving that we see Jesus, even in the midst of dying on the cross, nearing the last breath that he would take upon this earth, asking forgiveness for the very ones who were torching him. Just an incredible, incredible moving statement. Well, there's also the amazing resolve, the extraordinary resolve of Jesus and the disgusting sin that was taking place there at the cross. And I want you to see this, this is very interesting. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani? That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, this man is calling Elijah. 
And one of them at once ran, took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the other said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. I want to talk to you a moment just about the sponge. And this is something I had a great opportunity of going to um, Israel uh, uh, several years ago, along with some other couples in our church. And, and this is actually um, near a Roman, ancient Roman city. Um, it was an archaeological dig that they had there. And this was just outside uh, the Roman Colosseum there in the city of Bethshan. And the picture was taken, again, right next to a Roman Colosseum. That's where the Romans went to enjoy the, the entertainment, whatever event it might have been. So just outside that Roman Colosseum were what was called the Roman toilets. And our guide had us sitting down on these slabs. You can see these different slabs. And you'd sit on two slabs at a time and be the opening. You notice how close they are to be the opening between the slabs. And there below the slabs is a trough and gravity fed the water down the trough. And, and this was actually their public restrooms. And so as we sat there, the guide began to share with us um, um, what would uh, undertake there as the Romans, they went to the bathroom there in these public restrooms. And then their servants would have on a stick a sponge. They would dip it in the water in the trough and then they would wipe the uh, Roman um, soldiers or the Romans that were there before they went into the Colosseum and, and just an incredibly um, gro gro gross, I should say, thing that's going on there. But um, it's interesting that as we sat there and we listened to this born again Jewish uh, guy that was giving us the, the tour through Israel in these many days, she mentioned that it was very probable that the sponge that was used to give Jesus that, that, that drink there at Calvary as he died upon the cross was probably a sponge that was already used by one of the Roman soldiers there surrounding the cross. So horrible um, display, this final act of disgust. And even in the midst of it, Jesus was one that had this resolve to finish his work upon the cross. It's just incredible what was going on there. Finally, there's this um, final act, I could say, amazing witness of a super, uh, supernatural events, uh, extraordinary events that took place there at the cross. I want you to see this. Um, from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And at about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So for three hours as Jesus was upon the cross, there was darkness over that land, over that particular area there. And a, a very, um, very overwhelming, the supernatural event. Um, but not just the darkness. We also learn that behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth was shook and the rocks were split. The tombs were also opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised and coming out of the tombs after the resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. And then when the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, this truly was the Son of God. So these supernatural events that took place, there was the, the three hours of darkness, there was the earthquake that, that the soldiers and the centurion fell underneath their, their feet, the shaking of the earth. And then um, whether they, they realized some, some of the other um, miraculous supernatural events, the, the tearing of the curtain, we don't know for sure. Um, whether they, they saw any of the people that raised from the dead, perhaps they did. But this was a terrifying event to them, an event that, that in essence, brought them to, to this realization, I believe, that Jesus truly was the Son of God. So some of these um, factors involved, I, I believe with all my heart that the centurion did display a genuine confession of faith. Now I want to close just with two lessons for the heart. 
And the first one is this. Um, the power of the cross reaches all walks of life and even the hardest of hearts. All walks of life and even the hardest of hearts. Um, I wanted to just share this uh, story in closing. We see how the centurion and the, the soldiers underneath him were, were just amazed. They were in awe. They were in fear. They made this, this proclamation that Jesus truly was the Son of God. Um, it's a reminder that, yeah, even the gospel reaches even the most difficult of hearts, even the hardest of hearts, the most calloused of hearts. General Robert Lee, the commander of the Confederate armies during the America Civil War, was attending a church service at the end of the war. And after, at the conclusion of the sermon, General Lee actually came forward and, and he prayed about the things in his life that he had been convicted of during the message. And as the great Confederate general knelt praying, a former slave likewise stepped forward and kneeled right beside General Lee. He prayed for his own spiritual needs, and once he had finished um, praying, Lee rose to leave and then was stopped by a southern farmer slave owner. The slave owner was upset by the fact that a black slave would be allowed to kneel beside General Lee. And then General Lee, however, would have nothing uh, of it, and he replied to the man those very words, the ground is always level at the foot of the cross. And it's so true. The gospel reaches into the lives of all people, if you're here today and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, I want to tell you that no matter who you are, no matter where you live, whether you're rich or poor, famous or, or not famous and unknown, whoever you might be, the gospel's for you. It's for you and it's for me. The ground is always level at the foot of the cross. So that was one lesson for the heart, the power of the cross reaches all walks of life and even the hardest of hearts. There's a second lesson here though, and I want you to see it, it's this one. Jesus loves you and me more than anything, more than anything. His love was displayed so clearly there at the uh, cross. And again, I go back to this, this prayer that he prayed when he was dying there on the cross after being being tortured after being scourged and lying there upon the cross, just, just moments before his death, he asked God the Father to forgive the centurion, the soldiers underneath him, and all those that were standing there, for they did not know what they were doing. Jesus had forgiveness on his mind. He had this, this incredible love for you and I. Jesus loves you and I more than you'll ever know. I want to just close with this verse. Ephesians chapter 3, 17 and 18, the Apostle Paul wrote these words. I pray, and this was a prayer that he had, I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have the power, together with all the saints, to grasp how wide and how long and high and deep is the love of Christ. That love that Christ has for you and I, it's an incredible love. It's a love that began in eternity past and goes into eternity future. This love that, that Jesus has, it, it's wide. It goes out to everyone. It's a, it's a long love. It's a high love. It brings us and makes us heirs with Jesus Christ. It's a deep love. It goes to the very root of, of sin and evil in our culture. This love is a love that Jesus has for you and a love that he has for me. I trust you've come to experience that love of Jesus Christ. You've come to place your faith in Jesus so you could come to know that love that Christ has for you. And by the way, that love, don't forget, is that very same love that carries us through this whole coronavirus thing. It's that same love that reaches into your heart when you're lonely. That same love that, that calls out to you when you're going through difficult times in life. That same love that, that is there always. It'll always be there. Jesus loves you, and he loves me. Let's pray. Dear God, I thank you for that incredible love that Jesus has for us, that love that, that was displayed there upon the cross of Calvary. Jesus, thank you for that love. Remind us of that incredible, amazing love that we can know through Jesus Christ. God, we also are reminded of that the fact that the gospel reaches all people. 
it's a message, it's a hope that everyone can grab hold of. God, I thank you for those truths that we learned here today as we've looked through the eyes of the centurion there at the cross. God, we love you and we thank you and praise you. Just encourage your hearts, we ask, through these days ahead. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.